You know what horror creature really needs to make a comeback? Ghosts. It's always demons, or demons spelled with an A, or zombies, or just a really big dude in a mask. And yeah, all those are great when well done. I mean, zombies are my favorite monster, but something about ghosts is just beyond other ones. Like, imagine putting a tank shell through Michael Myers. Man's getting his cheeks clapped, it's as simple as that. But you can't shoot a ghost, it's just gonna go right through the thing. You can't hide from one either, even if you lose it in a chase, it's just gonna hover through walls till it finds you and eats your soul. Why am I going on about ghosts for most of the first paragraph of this video, you may wonder? Have I been playing too much Dead by Daylight again, and I'm just venting the rage I feel that only that game can drive me to. Well, yes, I have been doing that, that's not the reason. It's because now is the time for Do or Don't Night Haunt. So if you're interested in spooky ghosts spookily reaping the souls of the mortal realms in a spooky manner, then here's the video for you. But before I go on, you gotta note that this video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. The hidden mobile game with over 80 million downloads is once again sponsored my channel, so why don't I introduce you to a couple of reasons you should be one of them. Let me give you my top three favorite factions to showcase some of the absolutely stellar champion designs this game has that you can use in battle yourself. It's all about aesthetics for this ranking. I don't care if they perform well. I want my army to look cool. Besides, they all perform well. There's no bad champions in Raid. First off, and I'm sure that you are absolutely gasping in shock when I tell you this, my favorite is the High Elves. If me liking elves is news to you, then you are clearly new to the channel but just in case you weren't aware, I love me some pointy ears and Ray delivers on them fantastically. They look elegant, like they ride the weaves of magic to battle. If that was too flowery of a sentence to you, elves got me down bad in Warhammer and they do here too. But my second favorite is one that isn't exactly, uh, elegant or pretty, or anything at all like those two things, because it's the orcs. Well, yes, they're not the most attractive fellows, they hit like a bus, and there's something nice about recruiting someone ugly. You're never gonna lack self-confidence if you got a bunch of orc champions, and when you deploy them to battle, you'll feel just as good. My third favorite is the dwarves. Now, I've been playing a bit of Minecraft lately, and while I love elves the most, my first instinct in that game is to dig a hole as deep as possible and avoid all contact with the surface. And the dwarves are my spirit creatures because of this. I relate to them more than anything. And visually, they're dwarves. They've got beards, they like armor, and they're the perfect height to headbutt you in the groin. I'm a simple man, and Raid's Dwarfs gives me what I want, visually. There's plenty of other factions to look at, of course. Spanner Lords are pretty damn cool if you like medieval knights, which who doesn't? But there's some big news I gotta share with you. Raid just had an update with a ton of new features, including a new dungeon, the Sand Devil's Necropolis. Fight through it to earn oil and use Artifact Ascension, a brand new feature to help make your heroes all the stronger. There's new champions being added as well, including some festive holiday ones. Tis the season, after all. And something really special, if you log in seven times between now and February 20th, you get a character based on Ronda Rousey as a special legendary champion. Again. Ronda Rousey, as in the MMA fighter Ronda Rousey. She's available for all players old and new, so there's no reason not to pick her up. So if you're sick of using a sword and just want to beat the ever-loving shit out of someone, just log in seven times before February 20th and you can. Additionally, using code RAID RONDA, which is once again available for all players, you can get a whole load of goodies to help level her up, such as 500k silver, 5 energy refills, and a 3-day 100% XP boost. And I'm not done announcing goodies yet, since if you happen to be an Amazon Prime member, there's a whole load of extra goodies you can get at this very moment. If you're still unconvinced, don't worry, because I'm not done. If you use my link in the description and pinned comment or the handy QR code on this screen at this very second, you'll get unique rewards worth $30. The free epic champion Vergus, 200k silver, 1 energy refill, 1 XP boost, and an ancient shard for more fantastic champions the moment you log in. All of this will be waiting for you here in the inbox. Rewards are available only for the next 30 days and for new players only, so download Raid now and I'll see you there. Okay, time to get spooky. The Night Haunt are ghosts. That's really it, honestly. Nagash being Nagash, though, means that a decent portion of them are made ghosts in some assholeish way because Nagash is a prick. To show you what I mean, Nagash really likes to make them have forms that reflect some past wrongdoings. Of course, given who Nagash is, his ideas of past wrongdoings range from someone who actually did something horrible to doing something that Nagash doesn't like. For example, let's say you were a healer in your life. That means you committed the grievous sin of making sure people stay alive longer, thus delaying how long it takes for Nagash to get their soul. As punishment, he will turn you into a being that exists solely to butcher others, all the while being aware of your actions while not being able to stop them. Isn't Nagash a really cool dude? Of course, there's also Kurdos Valentian, who is an actual piece of shit turned into a night haunt, so even if it's mostly by accident, sometimes Nagash does punish someone who actually deserves it. Sure, his main crime in Nagash's eyes was praising Sigmar over himself, but he still deserved it, so I'll give Nagash credit on this one. They've always been around in the Age of Sigmar, since necromancers like to dig around with people's souls, and if nothing else, having an army that can't be stabbed is very helpful. But until a good way into AOS's history and the second edition of the game, they weren't super integral to the narrative. And then for the second time in his existence, Nagash decided to mess around with magic pyramids to obtain supreme power. I covered this in my video about Nagash himself, but to sum it up, this game did what they did best and ruined it. It wasn't a complete failure, however, because all of the mortal realms were inundated in death magic from the ritual going haywire. This was important because anyone who used death magic like necromancers suddenly went from minor nuisance to, oh my god, this guy just raised a thousand zombies in his sleep. More importantly for this video, however, is the effect 
effect it had on the Nighthaunt. Not only did it simultaneously summon billions of them from beyond the grave back to reality, but it also allowed them to maintain their forms permanently. They're kind of like demons in that they need some ambient magic to keep themselves going for more than a few minutes. So all of reality being bathed in the shit meant that the spooky ghosts weren't a problem you could just wait out anymore. They rampage across reality for some time, eventually getting their own leader character named Lady Ollander, since at the time the Nighthaunt weren't exactly the most tactically minded of beings. Ghosts that feel nothing but anger towards the living aren't exactly the epitome of military brilliance, or organizational brilliance, or really doing anything that doesn't involve brutally murdering the living, but they at least could do that one very well. She organized them into groups called processions, because every Warhammer faction needs subgroups based on different abilities and motivations, and the ghosts are no exception to this. Then to once more move forward in the plot, Teclas and Nagash square down and Nagash lost. Not exactly a twist for the ages, that one. Between this and Alariel doing Nagash's ritual in reverse with life magic, the effects of Nagash's spell, which had come to be known as the Necroquake, mostly ended. The Nighthaunt's constant raging throughout the mortal realms had been stifled, but if you think they're gone, then you're out of your goddamn mind. That's more or less the history for what you need to know. They're really just vengeful ghosts that hate the living, so there's only so many specifics to discuss. But don't think this means that I'm just gonna breeze through the pros and cons of the Night Haunt, because there's plenty to talk about there. Naturally, if you like ghosts, you'll like the Night Haunt. Like I said, I think that ghosts have gotten pretty underrated as far as horror monsters go. Though perhaps that's just the Dead by Daylight fan in me shining through again, since every time I play against the nurse, I cry a bit inside. And outside. As ghosts, you get an army that causes the kind of terror that is only matched by the fear of hearing the words, I found your iPhone account in a professional setting. So if you like spooky times, then you'll love these fellas. And while I'd say they lean a bit more towards the evil side of things, given that Warhammer is a war game and they're led by Nagash, ghosts can be very sympathetic in their motives. So it shouldn't be too difficult to fluff your army as good or evil. Maybe your Nighthawk army only strikes out against chaos and a vengeful rage. Or perhaps they prefer to attack factions like the Idanith or the Auric War Clans, who, while they aren't necessarily evil, are certainly harmful. Or maybe they're the biggest group of assholes around and are all the same kind of ghost. The kind that are angry at the living not for personal reasons or some ideology that stuck with them in death, but because they've committed the sin of not also being dead. Either way, if you want to do so, you'll have no problems making it lore accurate. Kind of a running theme for Age of Sigmar armies, I've noticed. They're very homebrew friendly. They can also appear pretty much anywhere, sort of like the Skaven. If there's been a massive battle somewhere recently, and this being a Warhammer setting that accounts for 90% of all major land masses, they can rise up from the souls of the slain. If there's a graveyard nearby, you already know they're going to be swarming that place. And any place with a sufficient amount of death magic, regardless of the causes, attracts them like moths to a flame. Whatever the case, there's a reason for them to be at any part of the Age of Sigmar universe, which is nice. Similarly, they're at home in all kinds of engagements, big or small. If you want something skirmishy, imagine some small war bands of beastmen or Idaneth going on a raid, but on the way there, they're attacked by horror incarnate. On the other hand, during the Necroquake, there were armies of millions of the fuckers. So whether you want apocalyptic battles or something more fitting for a horror movie, like that weird one where the 1940s wacky Germans made zombies that weren't actually zombies, the Nighthaunt are right at home either way. Alright, I'm going off on a tangent now, so look at the video chapters to get back to the actually relevant video topic, but did anyone else think that movie, it was Overlord by the way, should have gone either all in on being World War II with a little bit of horror, or all in on the horror with a little bit of World War II? Like, I thought it was a decent and well-made movie, but I felt like they did it half and half on both, and it felt like it was just splitting its focus too much. It would suddenly cut from a World War II movie to a horror movie set in World War II, and then a couple of scenes later, switch back, and it felt like it was two unrelated movies in the same theater. Also, I wish people would either just do regular zombies again or commit to the bit. I hate how media like World War Z always has to make the zombies fast and annoying, and half the time they don't just come out and say they're zombies and beat around the bush, and it's really fucking annoying. Either make them special, infected like Left 4 Dead, or make them classic slow zombies. Stop being around the bush with it, for the love of God. Anyways, I should probably start talking about the Night Haunt again. So for tabletop positives, part of them being ghosts means that positioning is no issue for them. Mechanics-wise, this translates to them all having the fly ability. Is there a staunch line of storm vermin guarding lightning cannons in the back? Just go over them. A lot of terrain in your way that the enemy is using to hide some key units? This isn't total Warhammer, the oaks can actually go through walls. And they have abundant ways to either teleport or deep strike with. No matter the situation, if someone is trying to hide from you, you can make them pay for it dearly. They've also got a save that cannot be changed due to ethereal. So if someone walks up with a lot of rend or something else that makes it easier to wound you, you can just tell them to go to hell. And probably drag them down to it, now that I'm thinking about it. This makes the ghost a lot more survivable than they might otherwise be, especially against certain armies. Sure, this might not be super helpful against models that don't have Ren, like clan rats, but when the enemy's army's main strength is lowering your rune saves and they can't do it, that'll be a lifesaver. Add this on top of their magic being able to resurrect and heal themselves, and their survivability in battle isn't the worst in the game by far. And on the topic of setting people to hell, the Nighthawk excels at that. Several of their models have the ability to cause automatic and or mortal wounds, so once the Nighthawk get into melee range, they're gonna reap a bloody harvest. Chain Rasp Hordes, the basic battle line, have two attacks a pop and a leadership of 10 as long as the Dread Warden model is alive, which it should be. That's a potential 20 wounds from a single
single unit that isn't going to be routing anytime soon. This is your absolute most basic unit, by the way. Your other options live up to the hype, especially with your heroes who can support your army incredibly well. Not without caveats, of course, but we'll get to that later. We're still talking good. Their magical game is also pretty solid. You can buff their survivability, steal life from the enemy, and my favorite spell that lets the caster just teleport anywhere within the map that's at least 9 inches away from the nearest enemy. Kind of mediocre to position them with, since you can probably just fly there, but it's funny to imagine your opponent completely surrounding them and about to annihilate that model before it just instant transmissions away. Some primo shit, that is. And since they're part of the death faction, you can take Nagash in this army. In case you weren't aware, Nagash is a very good wizard. I briefly mentioned it earlier, but the Nighthawn also have some absurdly good leadership stats on their roster. To top it off, their armies are generally small relative to the other ones, so you'll almost never take any morale losses using them. And yes, I know that almost never is the kind of thing someone says before they get absolutely tabled, but hey, I can't stop the dice gods from bending you over and going to town. Mathematically, it's not likely to lose a night hunt game because of leadership. And that's all I'll say in the matter before every comment is an example of how they lost a night hunt game because of leadership. Lastly, they're models, in which I have three things to say. First off, they're all very good looking. Even if it's one like the Banshee that you can clearly see is still from Fantasy because they haven't taken it off the square base, it still looks damn good. Two is that they're actually really easy to paint. I'll freely admit that it might look hard trying to blend colors like the Night Haunt do, but really just got either some white primer and paint them down with a few shades of green and blue that slowly blend into each other, or paint them black and edge highlight with green and blue. And presto, you've got ghosts. Hell, depending on what paint you use, white primer and a wash alone might be good enough for you. The third and final thing is, of course, Tibia Mariner. What more can I say? The funny boatman has decided to pay a visit from Elden Ring to join Age of Sigmar. That alone should make you consider the Night Haunt. Of course not all is well and good in the quiet lands of the Night Haunt. First off, if you like playing his armies with anything resembling a happy ending in their future, it's not these guys. I know this is Warhammer and that's almost impossible, but it's doubly so for these fellas. They're tormented spirits brought back from the dead to fight, not exactly a pleasant afterlife. The best they can really hope for is to fade away into nothingness, given that Nagash isn't likely to ever not torment them, and constant battling doesn't really bring one peace. Additionally, and while this is highly subjective, I don't get a sense of their characters having, well, character. As an army, they have character, but their heroes and such are kind of just these larger-than-life figures. It's almost like they aren't people, but storytale archetypes in a way. Now, this is subjective, and you might damn well disagree with me, or hell, even find this to be a good thing, but to further the point, I tried looking up some Nighthaunt stories and only really found out that Soul Wars is apparently half-told in the perspective of a newly raised Nighthaunt, and the book Lady of Sorrows, which appears to not even take place from the Nighthaunt point of view, so who knows on that one. Again, could be entirely wrong, and this is more of an opinion than anything else, but if you want your army to be filled with interesting and unique characters, then you might want to skip these guys. I guess Nagash is technically a part of this army, and he's pretty fun. In a similar vein, they're an army that's perfect as background setting and fluff, but not so much for interesting stories. A story about the Night Haunt ravaging the land from the perspective of some survivors is good stuff, but it's kind of hard to imagine that one vengeful ghost is going to be better at telling a tale than another one. They make it feel more full as a setting, but they're one of those armies you look at and go, yeah, you're definitely not the protagonist of the story. If the description of Lady of Sorrows is anything to go by, not even their own story. They've also recently been hugely weak since, as I said, the Necroquake has largely ended. Like I said, they haven't gone anywhere, but at the moment, their time to shine has come and left. So not only are they probably going to hang back from the center of the narrative for some time, but their releases likely have slowed for a bit as well. While the Night Hunt are ever-present, they're also ever-present in a very inconsistent way. Since they require constant sources of death magic to stay around, they're usually present in brief bursts of violence before vanishing. On the one hand, this really helps with just how damn terrifying they can be. On the other, it means that they're even more of a rampaging plot point now. Picture this with me. Death magic has suddenly waxed strong, or a necromancer conducts a ritual that harnesses death magic in an area to a focal point. There'll be a lot of night haunt there, but once the problem is gone, then there's no more night haunt. What I'm trying to say is if you like a faction that's really going to get a substantial presence in an area they move to, these guys might not be the best fit. For a direct comparison, chaos corruption isn't quite permanent, but it's damn hard to get rid of. Whereas dealing with the night haunt in many ways is just a matter of getting rid of one issue and then they're gone. I'd almost say it's like dealing with an infestation of rats, but the rats in the setting are harder to get rid of than the ghosts. Tabletop cons now, we'll start off easy, work our way into the big problems. Ethereal means that their save cannot be modified by any means, negatively or positively. That second bit is a shame, but the benefits far outweigh the negative, so it's not crucial. Sure, it sucks no spells that boost your save or anything like that can help you, but it's not the biggest issue and the reverse is also true. The range game is also pretty mediocre. The Craven Throne Guard are actually pretty solid as far as range units go, but they're not going to be the focal point of the army. They can ignore cover and fire through terrain, which is fantastic, but compare the single range unit in the army to the extensive list of melee options available and you probably 
probably don't need me to tell you that you should be focusing on getting into melee range. Craven Throne Guard also need to be within a foot of an enemy in order to be able to shoot at them, which is kinda close to melee range, so you'd best be careful with positioning. For some more substantial issues, your endless spells suck cock. One of them is more likely to hurt you than anyone else, another is pretty much the same but is at least less likely to hurt you and fairly cheap, and one that can potentially heal or hurt everything within a certain radius. Healing always sounds nice, but random chance on it isn't something I'm willing to say is a good thing, and the Night Hunt already have enough regenerative capabilities as is. I find this really funny because their magic is pretty solid, but their endless spells are shite. And while I was saying how ethereal and regeneration abilities help them stay alive, their models generally have low wound counts to balance this out. They're not likely to fall apart on first contact, but combine this with the fact that they generally have a low model count, and you need to make sure you can kill a lot of enemies right away. Of course, they can retreat and charge in the same turn, so killing enough models to keep yourself alive isn't impossible, but it's still something to keep in mind when you're positioning. If nothing else, I guess you can just float through a wall and be hidden from ranged attacks. Not always viable, but it's funny to think about. Ethereal is also a heavy point tax. It'll make models feel a lot more expensive relative to their performance than they might otherwise be, especially if you roll like shit and ethereal means nothing. Kinda reminds me of the Adeptus Mechanicus and their invulnerable save. It's great to have, but it's your main defense, and if it fails, you're in trouble. You can regen or revive models to kind of offset it, but a higher point cost is something that's always gonna weigh heavily on you. Them being a smaller army also means that you might have issues either sticking to or grabbing a point. Yeah, they're good at killing, but eventually you'll hit a limit on how many clan rates you can kill before they all drag you down with them. If you're sitting on an objective, you might not have the numbers to hold it, and trying to push an objective, you might not be able to do it if you can't kill enough of them on the charge. You'll outnumber some armies, like the Stormcast, for instance, but a lot of other ones will outnumber you in turn. This sort of compounds on the last major rules issue I have with them, which is that they're undead, meaning they're a very hero-centric army, as most undead Warhammer armies are. If you lose your heroes, you're in deep shit. Best be careful with them. Finally, they're models. But wait, you might think. I thought you said they were good-looking. I did. I mean it, I promise. But take a look at all those small connecting bits, how half the models are barely connected to the base. Good luck transporting these things anywhere, motherfucker. So there's the basics of the Night Haunt. Cool models and pretty hard hitting once they get into range, but not much range and they're both more and less fragile than you'd think. If nothing else, just take Nagash, then you won't need to worry about half of your goddamn point cost not making its money back. He sure will. Thank you as always to my wonderful channel members. You are the death magic to my Night Haunt, keeping me around and going on to haunt YouTube forever. If you'd like to support the channel, feel free to subscribe or become a member. Either way, thank you for watching and take care out there. Alright, there's no joke here, I just need to ask people this to see if I'm just going insane. I kept calling the Night Haunt the Ideneth. I would write Ideneth in the script when I meant Night Haunt, I would say Ideneth when I meant to say Night Haunt for some reason, same thing. When I was looking more into the rules and models, I kept searching up Ideneth. Is this anyone else? What the fuck is wrong with me? I don't know why my whole filled brain is doing this. For the love of God, please tell me it's not just me. <laughs>